Dominate and Delegate is coming to Kickstarter and I have had the pleasure to have it here in my studio and tried it out to make a how to play video for you. In this video I am going to show you how the basic rules of this game works. I'm also going to go over a little bit about the campaigns and how they work. Because there are two different modes in this game. We have a skimrish mode where players go head to head in a one time match. And then we have the campaign. And that is where we venture out in these campaigns here to actually go out and battle another player because the campaign is a two player mode only. In this game we will produce buildings, we will produce units, we will deploy them out on the map and I am going to show you how they move around and how they actually work. Now what I have here in front of me is just a prototype so once you get the game on your table it might look a little bit different from what I have today. But this video is to give you an understanding of how the game mechanics actually works. So let's take a look at that. We are in the future, in the years of 2030 to 2035. And like I told you, this game has two different modes, a skimrish one and a campaign mode one. This here is set up like the campaign, but I need to say this is just an example. Because of course, depending on which part of the campaign you are playing, these tiles will be placed out differently. And in the start of the game, you are deploying units on the map according to the campaign guides. So depending on what the campaign will say, the map will look different and your deployed units will also look different. In this future, we actually have a good economy. Which is why there is a huge demand on energy. And when there is a demand, well, there will eventually be wars. Because people want more of what they cannot get. And this is where we come in. We are basically fighting over land and energy, trying to take over our opponent's buildings and destroy their units. In the basic rules of this game, a player will do their turn to the fullest. And a turn is set up during two different phases. The first one is the activation phase and the second one is the production phase, where we actually will produce our units on this little production line. And of course we will do some deployments, some movements and so on. But let's start by looking at the activation phase. Before I show you the actual activation of the units, I need to show you this player table. Because here we have a lot of information that we will use. On this player table here, we can see the different units that we can activate out on the board. Here we can see the name of the different units and next to it a little picture of how the units looks. Next to the names we can see which type of unit it is. This up here represents buildings. Here we have ground units. And when there is a symbol of just a person here it represents a unit that is not in a vehicle. Then we have the normal vehicles, meaning the ones that are not armored. And then we have armor vehicles. Lastly, we have planes. The next symbol here represents the tech level, meaning the tech level of whatever unit you would like to produce. In a campaign, you can only produce units that has the same tech level as the campaign mission you are doing itself. But the skimrish mode is always tech level 5, which means that, well, you can pretty much just ignore these numbers. The next one here is the production cost, meaning how much it will cost you to produce that unit. Next we have the time it takes to produce the unit you would like to produce. Meaning if you would like to produce a unit that has time 3, well, you place that unit on number 3 on the production line. Here we can see the speed of the unit itself, meaning how many spaces out on the board it can move. Next we have the range of the unit itself, meaning how far it can reach out on the map when it's attacking. And next we have what the unit can attack, meaning that this unit here, for example, 
can only attack ground units that are walking or unarmored units. But this one here, for example, can attack armored units and flying units and buildings as well as normal vehicles. Lastly, we have the special column. This here states if the unit that you are using out on the board have any special abilities. This one up here, for example, does not need any energy. And this one here means that any infantry attacks loses counter attacks. The harvester down here can load up some ore if it wants to. This means that it cannot enter any forests. This symbol here means that this unit can transport up to two units, while this unit here cannot move into forested, but it can choose if it wants to perform either a movement or an action during its activation. This one ignores shields. Again we have the transport. This down here means that it only have one ammunition meaning it can only fire once and then it's empty. At the start of an outdoor mission, you will receive a mission card. These are cards that will give you a little bit of text on what you are actually trying to achieve during this mission. So now let's start to take a look at the movements out on the map itself. First, we need to look at the player table to see how far this rack infantry can go. And we can see that this one here has a movement space of 1, meaning that it can move one step out on the map. But it cannot end its movement on any spaces that has water, mountains or another unit on it. Meaning that in this case here, this little feller can really only move over here or here. So your little ground units here cannot cross water, right? It makes sense. But if you construct a bridge, or if there is a bridge, well then you can actually pass it. But the bridge needs to be in one piece, because these bridges can actually break as well. And those movement rules applies to all of the ground units. But remember that some of the units, like this one here, the MCV for example, cannot enter a forest, while the other actually can. While air units are a little bit different, because they can actually move over any terrain. Which makes sense, I mean they're flying, right? They should be able to move over anything. And they also usually have a lot more movement than ground units. This one here, for example, the bomber has a movement of four, meaning that this one here could move four steps out on the board, closing in on their enemies. You may always move your own units through hexes that are containing your own friendly units. So I told you that a ground movement cannot end its movement on another hex with another unit on it, which is almost true, because the big armor tanks here can actually end their movements on the same hex as a little ground unit, meaning a walking unit. But the walking unit will get squeezed and killed, because they are driving right over them. And yes, you can do this on your own units as well. So if you feel like you want to get rid of a unit that you're not really using, well, you could squeeze them. An engineer infantry may use its movement to take over a building instead. When it does this, the engineer is removed from the map and the enemy building is swapped out with a building of your own. And the same thing applies if the engineer unit is next to an MCV. We remove the unit, we remove the opponent's MCV, and we replace it with our own. An infantry unit may also use its movement to board an adjacent transport unit. But once it has used this movement, its activation is over. And the same thing applies if it chooses to onboard a transport ship. It will be the only thing it does during this activation. A flying unit that has the symbol with only one ammo, meaning that it only has one ammo, remember, can use its movement to reload. But you need to have an energy above zero to be able to do this. 
and you need to be standing on a helipad. If you have these conditions, then you turn the little airplane away from the player. This indicates that now this is loaded again. The next time this unit fires, you will turn it facing yourself again, indicating that now you have fired this little unit. So once we have moved our little units out on the little board, we now go into the activation step. And now they get to do an action as well. So first we move them and then we do an action. And they can only do one of these actions, so they can't do several of them. And remember that if any of your units, meaning the little ground units here, have boarded or unboarded any transport ship, well then they are done for this turn and they cannot be activated now. But what can you actually do during the activation step? If you have a harvester out on the board and it's on the same spot as an ore, you can use its activation to load the ore. Now it's done for this activation, but you are carrying some ore at least. During the harvester's next activation, and if it is next to your refinery, you can choose to unload the ore. Every time you unload an ore, you receive six credits. But you need to have an energy higher than zero to be able to do this. If your engineer is standing next to a bridge that is broken, it can use its activation to flip the token over and repair it. Ta-da! Now you can cross water again. You may use a building's action to sell it. And you will get the amount of credits as the building is worth. Divided by half. The game won't be that kind, right? It never is. The only exception is the little refinery here. Because when you sell the refinery, you actually only get one credit. But that is because every time you sell a refinery, your harvester stays in the game. A construction yard can use its activation to become an MCV. But it cannot move during this round. And the MCV may actually also convert into a construction yard instead. When you do the campaign, you will also encounter civil buildings and special buildings. Now depending on what the campaign text says, different things will happen once you interact with these buildings. And some of them might even contain a little surprise for you. And of course, you can choose to attack your enemies. But now, how do you do that? Before we make an attack, we need to make sure that the unit you're attacking with can actually attack what you want to attack. Here, for example, this MG infantry can only attack other infantries or unarmored ground units. And next, we also need to make sure that we are within range of whatever we would like to hit. In this case, this unit here has a range of 1. But if we look at this unit up here, it actually has a range of 1, 2, 2. While this artillery can only use from 3 to 4 spaces away. Meaning that this can actually not reach adjacent spaces, it can only reach further away. Which means that if, for example, this little infantry here would like to attack this infantry here, well, it could. Because we can attack another infantry unit and we are within range. But we would not be able to attack the armored vehicle. Because, well, it is armored and it is more than one space away. The same thing applies to the building. Even though the building is within range of this infantry little soldier, it cannot attack buildings. But if the white player here would be attacking the red, then according to the table, the building would be able to hit the little infantry soldier because they are within range and they are allowed to fire at infantry. The infantry soldier are also within range and they could reach and fire against the infantry. But the tank would not be able to fire at the infantry. Because first of all, they cannot fire on infantry according to the player table. And they are not within reach. If we look at this artillery here, this one have three to four 
in range, meaning that it cannot reach any spaces that are within one or two spaces away from itself. It can only reach up to three or four spaces away, meaning that in this case it would be able to hit the vehicle over here. But it would not, however, be able to hit the vehicle that is over here, because there are no tiles in between the space where the artillery is and its enemy, because you cannot fire over non-existing tiles. Units that have more reach than one can actually fire over mountains or other obstacles. A unit that has more than one reach can actually fire over mountains to reach their opponent. Whenever a unit is being attacked, it has the option of retaliate but only if it can fire on the type of vehicle that is attacking it, and only if the player wishes to retaliate. So if you are within range, and you can attack the enemy that you have in front of you, you can choose to attack. If you manage to hit your opponent, well, they will be destroyed. Unless they have a shield. Like this unit here, for example. It has a shield. Meaning that to be able to destroy this unit, you actually need to attack and hit it twice during your turn to be able to defeat it. If you destroy a harvester with ore on it, the ore will actually stay on the board, but the harvester is gone. If you manage to destroy a transporter with units being transported, well, they all die. And units on a transporter that is being attacked cannot attack back. If you destroy a bridge and there's units on that bridge, well those units are also dead. And the bridge is flipped to its broken side. The designer of this game actually has a little tips for you and this is every time that you have activated any of your units, you flip them to the other side, indicating that now you have activated these units. During the next activation, you simply just turn them in the other direction. In this way, you do not need to reset every unit at the end of your round. And you can pretty easily have an overview of what you have done and have not done. So that was the movements and activations of your units. But remember that you do this for every unit at once. Meaning that you do not move them first and then activate them. No. You move your unit and then you activate that unit. And then you flip it to the side to show and remind yourself that you have activated that unit. And then you go on to your next unit. You move it and you activate it. Flip it to the side and go on to the next unit and so on. Once you have activated your units, we go into the production phase of your turn. Now the production phase of your turn is where? Well we produce our units and buildings and we will do that by using this production line here. And this here is actually your secret little production line. So your enemies don't really know what is going on and what is going to pop out. But the first step of the production step is to continue production. During the first step of the production phase, we need to move our units that are on the assembly line one step to the left. But if you do not have any energy, meaning below zero, the only one you move forward is the power plant and not the rest. Step number two is where we get to deploy any finished units, meaning the units that are on the ready spot on the assembly track. So this unit here can now be deployed on the map. When you deploy your buildings, you cannot deploy them further away than two steps from your factory, unless it is a rack or MG tower, as it is in this case. This here is an MG tower, which means that I could place it further away than two steps from my factory but I cannot place it where there are any water, bridges, or ores. And I cannot place it on mountains either. 
but I could place it over here for example. If you deploy anything else than a construction yard, power plant or MG tower, your energy is reduced by 1. But if you deploy a power plant, your energy is raised by 4. And if you deploy a refinery, you're also allowed to deploy a harvester at the loading and unloading spot of the refinery at the same time. When you deploy your infantry, they need to be deployed on any free space next to your barracks. Your vehicles and dropship units can only be deployed on these two hexes in front of your factory. Meaning that you would not be able to deploy them on any of the other available hexes next to your factory. It's only these two. And your fighter or bomber planes may only be deployed on your own helipads. These planes should be deployed pointing away from the player that deploys them. Again, signaling that this one is loaded. And then we have these little uplink towers here, which really is a link to the heavens which is the fury of the heavens, because these ones here will let you drop bombs from the sky on your opponents, if you are playing in skimrish mode. Because when you're playing the campaign mode, the campaign will actually let you know what will happen with the uplink. But once you have built one of these uplinks, you will place the orbital strike token on the production queue slot 8 on your production track. Step number three of your production phase is the recycled phase. And this is where you actually get to cancel any of your productions. When you do this, you will get the full amount of the cost back. Meaning that you will raise your credits with the same amount that this building cost you to start the production in the first place. Now we enter the production order step. And this is pretty much where we order which units we want to produce on our little assembly line here. And we will do this in secret. We will put out the units that we can assembly on our assembly track. And we will of course need to pay the cost and we will need to make sure that we put them on the right spot on the assembly line as it take time to build. But there are some restrictions here. Because you can only have as many infiltries as you have barracks out on the board. And you can only have as many vehicles or tanks or airplanes in total in your production queue as you have deployed factories. And you can only have as many buildings in your production queue as you have deployed construction yards. Please note that an MVC is not considered to be a construction yard. It needs to be flipped on this side. So that's the player's turn. You do the movements of your little units and you activate them, then you go through the production phase. Once you're done, you flip this little round token here up one step and the turn goes over to the next player. Depending on if you're playing skimrish mode or campaign mode, well, the game will of course end in different ways. But there is actually one more thing I would like to show you. Because in this game, you also have indoor missions. Every now and then in the campaign, you will encounter indoor missions. And these are kind of like riddle missions. It's little puzzles that you need to figure out how to complete. And you will move around in this little building here and solving different tasks. Depending on what the mission says, of course. There will be no production phase here because, well, you will not produce anything. So this is kind of like a little dungeon. And one player will become the game master, while the other player tries to figure out the mission. At the start of the indoor missions, both players will read the mission text, just to get an understanding of what is going on in this mission. But then there are text in blue boxes, and this should not be read immediately, because some of these texts explain what the character is actually viewing. And when they get within four spaces away from whatever the text explains, that is when the other player, meaning the game master, reads the text and explains what the player is actually viewing. 
Eventually, the game master will see text that is in a red box. This means that it should not be read out loud for the other player. It is only for the game master. And when you read the blue text, be a little bit kind to your fellow player. I mean, if they do not fully understand, or if you read it in a way that makes them a little bit unsure of what's actually going on, well, try to explain it in the best way possible, so they actually have a way of completing and reaching their goal. So the mission text will tell you where you should deploy your figure. It will also show you which items out in this little room that you can interact with. These items will have a blue text in the campaign, meaning that any item that has a blue text is an object that the character can interact with. And when they are within four spaces of line of sight from the object, the game master will read the text and give the player a little bit clearer understanding of what they're actually seeing. So the indoor missions will work kind of like an outdoor mission. One player will take their turn, do their movements and their actions. But the difference here from the outdoor mission is that the player can actually choose if they want to do the action first and then the movement. On the outside missions, remember, we need to do the movement first and then the actions. It's not like that here. Once one player have taken their turn, the turn goes over to the other player that will take their turn. And the player that is not taking its turn at the moment will become the game master, reading out whatever the players are encountering in these dungeons. To do movements out on the board, you simply move your little figure the amount of steps that you can according to your table. You cannot, however, move through walls. And you cannot move diagonal either. If you want to move through a door, you need to make sure that it is open and not closed. If you want to, you can also choose to open and close the doors. Triggers meaning things that happens when you interact with certain object. And again, what happens? Well, that depends on what the mission says. Or you can choose to use an action to interact with terminals. If they are red, well then they are turned off. If they are green, well then they are activated. And if you find anything out on the board, well, you can pick it up. Maybe it triggers some happening, or maybe you are supposed to use it in another space in the building. You can also choose to attack an opponent. And the same rules as the outside rules would apply. You need to have line of sight, you need to be within distance, and of course you cannot attack through walls. If the attacked character wants to retaliate, well, then it can. When playing this game, every now and then you will also encounter something that is called Fog of War. This means that there are actually more to this map than we can see at the moment. But it is being covered right now. And we will first know what will happen here when we actually reach these tiles. And this also applies on the outside mode. Here you can also encounter fog of war. And that is how you would play the indoor scenarios. Again, the game would go back and forward between the players doing movements and action. But here you can actually choose if you want to do an action first and a movement second. But you can still fight, you can interact with objects, you can put on security cameras, you can move robots. There are a lot of things that you can do in the indoor missions as well. And for me, this is a cool little feature in a war game to actually have small little puzzle dungeons. As the campaign goes on, you will also receive reward cards. These are cards that will give you, well, a reward that you can use in your future games. And there are quite a few of these. As the campaign progress and you move forward, well, you will fill in these campaign cards. Here you write down any reward cards that you have, any victories, anything else that you would like to let your future you know about the campaign. So when we do the outside campaign missions, we use these little tiles here. These are double-sided. We have the outside like a little forest, meadow, and then we have the desert here. But when you are playing the skimrish mode, you are actually using this big board here instead. Again, we have a meadow side 
and we also have a desert side on the other side. And there you have it, my friend. That was dominate and delegate. This was the basic rules. There are more things for you to explore once you get the game. I mean, you have the outside mode, you have the indoor mode, you have little surprises with the buildings, you have the skimmerish mode. There are tons and tons of gameplay here and there are a lot of replayability in this game. And like I said, this is just a prototype. I just have the prototype campaigns here so I really haven't seen that much yet. I bet that the finished game will be thick. That, my friend, was Dominate and Delegate. This game will be out on Kickstarter in August. If you want to know more, check out the links down in the description. If you are into role-playing game, if you're into dungeon crawlers and war games, well this one is probably for you, because you have the whole package here. Which is quite unique, I would like to say. But if you want to know more, check out the links down in the description. This was the video I had for you this time, my friend. If you like what I'm doing here, give me a thumbs up, uh, put a comment in there, subscribe to the channel. But most importantly, my friend, keep on spreading that board gaming love I know you all have.